It was Carl Douglas, a remix of uh, Kung Fu Fighting, Gregory Isaac. Uh, it's a lot about this, the, the Bitcoin scene right now. It's uh, kids uh, uh, learning how to uh, fight very hard into the world of mathematics and finance, actually. And uh, there are a lot of uh, repercussions in the real world. And there are a lot of dreams at stake. So I'm here to introduce you Bitcoin on behalf of uh, uh, some Bitcoin developers that asked me to be here. I contributed uh, some things to the uh, code of Bitcoin, some patches, but I'm not one of the core developers. Um, Genjix suggested I would uh, come uh, here. He's running, he's a chairman of the Bitcoin consultancy, which is now based in uh, Varso. And I thank him for the trust he gave me in presenting Bitcoin. I will do my best. My background is in uh, philosophy of technology. I'm a PhD uh, candidate for the University of Plymouth. So my approach is not just technical. I am a student of uh, philosophy and I come from the linguistic scene. So my approach to programming is from computational linguistics. And uh, therefore I will also insert some aspects which are concerning philosophy. I think Monet uh, asks for it. So why it is important to present Bitcoin nowadays, I think it's because the perception that was in the mainstream media was very uh, extreme. And the first impression that Bitcoin gave is that the developer scene was about this. Uh, well, while some developers might in their private life decide to join one or the other struggle for uh, the good or, uh, of humans and the bad of the banks, I would suggest that this is not how the Bitcoin developers look. And clearly, if the Bitcoin developers have chosen to develop a money system, is definitely people that uh, tries to get past this phase and gets over with a construct, a parse construct. Uh, following this impression, people started thinking that the Bitcoin developers must have been some generation coming out of the WikiLeaks. Um, and this is the most famous figure of Wikileaks. While this might hold true that many Bitcoin fans, boys and girls, like Wikileaks for the humanistic approach that has to information and society, still it's not exactly true. Other uh, people might think that Bitcoin developers are just in for the drugs and the loose. In fact, it's true that the system in its early stage was actually used to smuggle drugs online and to whitewash money. There was a lot of uh, traffic coming from one side and the other of the world and people still don't know what it is. Uh, while it holds true this happened, still the Bitcoin developers are not interested into this. So what are the Bitcoin developers actually? Um, if you are so confused and you get uh, uh, no hints of what it is the technology we are talking about, this might be the impression that you get and it's quite scary. So, I'm here to uh, try to define why uh, it's a sexy technology, what we are talking about, and why a lot of people actually get involved in developing it. This is the outline of my presentation, which will last about 45 minutes. I will try to stretch it into uh, 30 minutes and allow for uh, questions and answers. For 45 minutes is okay. Okay. Well, we have uh, uh, 15 minutes between presentations. Although okay. We're a bit late, but we'll shift it a so little bit. So I can, I can be longer. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Karen. Can I have a, a, a refill of water? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is just the outline. You're not missing um, the, the first part of this presentation is uh, about transmodernism. So uh, I'm trying to uh, uh, actually uh, define on a philosophical um, um, plane what is this approach, what are we going to witness with the rise of Bitcoin. Um, following, I will uh, uh, present you the inner and outs of uh, Bitcoin the, as, a, as a technology, then uh, conclusions, and then pointing out possible things buzzing in Amsterdam, and then references. So, these are the two quotes that I like to start with. And one is from a book that uh, has recently come out uh, called Commonwealth, which is the third book of the trilogy Empire, Multitude, and Multitude by Negri and Hart, who are uh, regarded as 
uh, quite important and very widely translated postmodernist philosophers. And this is what they uh, define when they talk about transmodernism. They define transmodernism as an approach to modernism that is not oppositional, purely oppositional, and is not just embracing modernism for what it is. But they define it as a transversal approach to modernism. And it's aimed to actually generate new forms of rationality and, at the end, new forms of liberations. The other quote is from Bernard Litter, an important figure even in the conceptualization of Euro money. And uh, this uh, uh, researcher and, and successful theorist, practitioner and businessman has written a book, The Future of Money, in which he also uh, mentions uh, this aspect, that the information age, what I will call later the dig digital immanence, the immanent process of the digital, is uh, calling for a, a breach of the third taboo, what he calls the third taboo is money. So, from a philosophical perspective, what is very important to do uh, at the beginning of this discussion on money, and then I will leave you with these philosophical considerations, it will get more technical, but still it's important to understand why the financial system is there. I already omit part, uh, from this presentation part of uh, my previous presentation that I gave at the Council Communication Camp uh, one month ago, uh, in which I actually explained why actually capitalism was born, at least from the interpretation of the Les Guattari book uh, Anti Oedipus, and how capitalism is, is uh, capitulating, uh, uh, how it's uh, necrotizing. And, oh, thank you. And jumping over this part, I'd like just to mention here that the financial system exists as an abstraction movement from what we call the commons, which can be actually the values that a community shares and produces and exchanges. So the desires of people as well, the things that can get activated, that are out there and can get activated out of human agency. So the, um, the, the abstraction, the movement of abstraction that financial, the financial economy has operated on, on human existence is very important to understand. Uh, if we talk about money. And it is, uh, we can trace this kind of interpretation both in very common uh, uh, quotes, again, Negri and Hart here, but I, would, I could quote as well uh, Andre Gortz or uh, um, as well uh, Christian Marazzi, who is a well quoted economist raising up in, in, in interpreting what is happening in financial economy. So this radical abstraction was already defined by one of the main theorists. Uh, Georg Simmel, who defined in a philo philo Philosophie des Geldes in 1900 that the movement of money is a movement, is, is a the function of money, is a function of mediation. It makes the man an indirect being, it mediates desires and values. And that's how actually capitalism could be successful at the race of capitalism because it instaurated an axiomatic relationship between desires of people, meaning you're not anymore the one you're born to be with. You can become anyone in virtue of the mathematics, of the numbers, of the things you have and you can exchange. So you can buy labor of people with these numbers, meaning you can become anyone you can be. So the caste system went down and actually all kinds of things that enclosed our society into roles. This was the freedom of capitalism. This was the American dream. And we all thought it was a very good idea at the time it came. So, this uh, indirect relationship has grown nowadays to the point in which we need another change and this is probably a change that we, we will remember in history because it is comparable to the industrial revolution so back to bitcoin this is just a quote of a few points of what was just a, a mail exchange on a mailing list in that time in which i was discussing the nature of bitcoin which was then pasted on the bitcoin forum and label it as the Bitcoin manifesto. So unfortunately for me, because I hate manifestos, I prefer much more how-tos, uh, I'm like the first hit on Google, if you Google for Bitcoin manifesto. I hope not for long. So um, whoever dares to write a manifesto for Bitcoin, I think the Bitcoin people won't like it. So the, uh, uh, coming back to what is interesting into uh, the email exchange I'm talking about are these five points. 
Uh, first of all, don't judge bitcoins from things like drug exchange or whitewashing or just like the, the, the fact that people have demonstrated that it is also possible in the new system because it is possible in the present system and it doesn't matter if people, the early adopters of a technology have actually a bad taste they will actually enjoy showing you the bad taste they will actually throw the moralist that will step into the technical discussion and say oh but this is bad or this is good they will throw these moralists saying this is just technology and technology can be used in different ways and it depends from the use that we do with it so uh, one thing for sure that is uh, brought forward by Bitcoin is the end of what I call the flow capitalism so there is a uh, um, uh, capitalism as defined by uh, people like uh, Weber uh, is the, uh, basically the revenue, the fact that people can benefit forever from the revenue of what they have already. So this kind of mechanism of revenue was instaurated in the flow of digital capitals. The only way you can transfer money digitally is by passing through the big monopolies that are banks and transaction systems. Not just for the fact that they offer an uh, API, an application protocol interface for verification of the, this transaction. Not just by that fact, because innovation can come and we will see why. Another thing that uh, Bitcoin gives is horizontal, an horizontal network of trust. So it reinstaurates actually a platform for having a uh, uh, creation of different networks of trust uh, in a horizontal way. It, has, uh, uh, it, it offers a way out of revenue stagnation, which I already um, mentioned in, in, uh, in the flow capitalism and actually offers us yet another manifestation of what I call digital immanence this is the end of the philosophical description <coughs> uh, parenthesis, I know it can be kind of harsh to present it to a technical public but I think that what we do with it it's important immanence is a word that was well used also by Spinoza a philosopher here from Amsterdam who actually defined in this way what also Heidegger previously defined as a pre-ontological stage of knowledge. So the, the fact that it exists a freedom in what is not yet, uh, in, in, in what Schumpeter called disruptive innovations. And this freedom is immanent in the sense that there's a relationship to reality that will change it. So what I'm arguing here is that also laws will actually change in consequence to this technological discovery. I might also, it's over here with the philosophical quote I promised, but uh, I might also quote here Bruno Latour, uh, anthropological, uh, uh, symmetrical anthropology, so his, his <coughs> kind of uh, uh, literature on the fact that every technical discovery can be also affecting the political and the social world, and this often the politicians don't understand, I'm sure you do. So, let's go to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a, a digital born currency, it's not the first. You might remember we were just mentioning before David Schaum, who right here in Amsterdam actually used was one of the earliest adopters of the uh, Xiaomian, uh, Xiaomian uh, what they are called Xiaomian uh, contracts. It's not purely uh, based on uh, Xiaomian uh, contracts, we'll see. Uh, it has, it uh, basically creates a finite resource, so it's deflationary as a currency and it does by um, tapping the world production to the point of 21 million units and uh, it doesn't fear that much the deflationary uh, cap because it has eight point digits after the comma so it can be actually fractionalized yet it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not a, a fiat money it cannot be expanded Yes, kind of. are, are fractions the way they are supposed to be used? It's a while ago that I read about uh, Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but my main practical uh, question mark was uh, if it's limited to 20 million coins, uh, that there's no way that, that uh, each uh, uh, inhabitant of this planet can own even one coin in the end. So are, are you supposed to deal in fractions? My answer to it is uh, we are supposed to deal with more currencies. That's the most natural. All right. And 
and I will get there. Yeah. But uh, uh, otherwise, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin fans, like uh, I would call them uh, Bitcoin fundamentalists, mm -hmm. uh, uh, would say that yes, we will deal with fractions. But but is 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 the, isn't this limit of twenty one million very curious? It seems to be an error in the design. It's it's a, it's a design. It, it's a, I think it was designed to be so. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the limit is, of course, uh, uh, a marked uh, property of the design, and that gives you a very uh, a typical economy if you base it on that. But just the, the simple number, that it's, it seems too low for the world population. Yeah. It's, uh, well, it depends. I mean, uh, coming back to the vision behind, you mm -hmm. know, which has to do with philosophy, uh, this is the debate whether the world should have a, a unique currency or not. Mm -hmm. In my humble opinion, I think this is a bad idea. Because diversity brings uh, uh, the opportunity to actually match different values and not to not have just one single rationality in the world. But the World Bank would argue this is where they wanted to go if it wouldn't be a complete failure by now. But regarding Bitcoin itself, you're, you're supposed to think of Bitcoin not as a coin, but as a kilogram of gold, and you're supposed to trade in ounces or something. Well, it's more reliable than gold, if, if no yeah, one Okay, breaks but it. I mean the, to, to drive home the, the point of the fractions. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Let me go on and then, uh, because I'm getting lost to, okay. uh, to, into the fraction. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting fractionized. <coughs> yes? And why is it more reliable than gold? Uh, well, I don't know if it's more reliable. I mean, it depends. Um, it's using a hashing algorithm with SHA-256, uh, 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 which was broken in uh, 11 rounds out of 16, as far as we recall. <laughs> So it might be not so reliable, I don't know, but it looks very reliable. I mean, it depends what do you think is the security of a place like Fort Knox was. Uh, actually, it's very high security and it's very hard to transport very heavy stuff and stuff like that. So some people say the gold is stolen from there. And that's a conspiracy theory, but uh, yeah. the, the point is no one can check it because no, no, no numbers are published. And this is much more transparent. Yeah, that's that's it. So it may not be uh, safer, but you can be more certain that it's at, at a particular safety level. The trust, the the architecture of trust behind any formulation like Bitcoin is the most interesting thing. So let's say it's less efficient than gold in being secure, but it's more resilient. Might be more resilient in a way. And let's try to envision what does that mean. So, ah, one important point from this slide is that the transactions, and, and this is a design issue, we don't need, uh, I mean, so far with digital transactions, if we did the digital transactions, we needed to trust the other person that the number, or the intermediary, that the number is authentical, that there is not a double payment, so-called, in, in accounting uh, science. Uh, so, we need to trust the other end that that number, which is just a number, is actually corresponding to a value that someone verifies that that value exists. With Bitcoin, this is not necessary anymore because what you are giving me is actually a unique digital artifact. So in the moment in which you give me that, I don't need to trust you. I need to trust the algorithm that authenticates the thing you're giving me. So this changes a lot in the game, in the game of exchange and of trust. If we basically go back to the situation of cash. You are a shopper, you uh, get paid for uh, in cash for what you're selling, the only thing you need to verify is the cash that you're getting. You don't need to know anything about the person that is paying. So, uh, miners. Bitcoins are made by mining. This, the unicity of these artifacts are made by, is made by mining. The mining is basically a very um, 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 stupid, <laughs> can I say it? Uh, um, not, not the people that are mining, but the thing that is doing the mining is kind of stupid, uh, I would say. I mean, it's a trial and error algorithm. Basically, it, uh, the mining consists in, uh, in, uh, in trying out nounces, cryptographically called nounces, 
and uh, making hashes out of it and seeing if these hashes correspond to a particular uh, to particular features for instance now uh, uh, the feature is having uh, an, a certain number of zeros at the beginning of the hash so if you find the hash uh, that has this number of zeros and you can match it to a nouns that you tried out then you are a progressive nouns then you have found a coin so it's kind of uh, stupid this, this trial and error the, the difficulty goes up exponentially with this method and has gone up uh, uh, very much exponentially as you see and well I'll mention this since we were also talking about it these are the only negative curves in the growth of difficulty and these are actually considered also here this is the most recent are considered actually proofs that there was a uh, a big uh, uh, botnet mining uh, around and this botnet went down for one day and people were really wondering like how comes that the whole network only once goes down because if there is a lot of different people mining no matter how big is your cellar with computers people is really doing this in the US uh, still you don't have that much computation power so mining is uh, consolidating the authenticity of the entire network now I would like to make a point here because it's also very important that there are a lot of uh, uh, un, uh, uninformed considerations about mining around let's say that Bitcoin is actually a waste of electricity because you are just generating coins out of electricity and then you put them into the system so what some economists call a, a Rube Goldberg machine so this was my first reaction when I saw Bitcoin exactly the, 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 the same reaction when I saw Bitcoin 2008, in 2008 <coughs> on Slashdot it was on Slashdot at that time and being also like a, a very nature lover person and I'm very much involved also in the transition uh, way of thinking uh, I don't buy something that is just like made out of electricity but then thinking further what mining is doing is actually authenticating a network of things that are unique which is something very difficult in the digital world so it's creating authenticity now let's look at how we create authenticity in the existing world I mean the, the world of money of euro money or the money a national money we have a huge building with very thick walls we have machines inside printing with the very alchemical secret processes on paper and we have guards at the perimeter how much that costs so in terms not just of money but in terms of violence of pure violence it costs a lot so coming back to a biopolitical interpretation and quoting Foucault in this uh, Bitcoin releases the, the monopoly of violence in authenticating some objects for the game we are playing to a crowd in this case because behind money there is definitely violence uh, it's, it's a chain of events that you need to have in order to establish a, a, a state so that, that is about govern, uh, governance but let's not touch too much the philosophy now anymore so uh, broken that spear for, uh, for, for the mining process I think uh, it becomes more interesting actually because one thing that it's clear is that Bitcoin uh, uh, offers one of the implementations one of the possible implementations there will be more in future for collective constituency so people can come together and constitute a society that recognizes itself in uh, actually having some uh, uh, value exchange system another thing that was said uh, about Bitcoin is that in the early stage is that it's anonymous is not true to be anonymous actually the the very system uh, that uh, uh, which Bitcoin works and the triple accounting systems work is absolutely not anonymous is a big innovation in the accounting system is called triple accounting 
and it's actually letting you know all the transactions that have been done in the whole system the way Bitcoin actually uh, makes privacy possible into such a system and this is the innovation brought by Bitcoin is by creating pseudonyms so what you can do with Bitcoin is you can create a uh, address that you use for transactions uh, uh, without any restriction so you have one uh, node and this node will generate as many address as, as many pseudonyms you want every time you will use this pseudonym in transaction which will point out to your wallet then uh, this pseudonym will be in the history so you understand that one could just download the whole blockchain of Bitcoin which is still available in its entirety and, and track all the transactions and people is doing it, you can graph it so maybe you don't know this pseudonym to whom belongs but then you can, uh, of course, you can track the IP number from which this pseudonym have connected so where it has entered the, from the network then of course the pseudonyms can use Tor so it's Tor, the anonymizer, is not Bitcoin so of course I would argue uh, leaving aside the fact that anonymity uh, is or not important in, in our society I would say that if you really want to be anonymous you still need to do a lot of work and it's just like yet another technology that by using and being anonymous you need to know how to be anonymous so if you don't know how to be anonymous there is no point I mean, in telling people that it's anonymous might have been a, a honeypot, <laughs> this, this kind of attitude, uh, involuntary honeypot uh, at the beginning actually you can track the transactions that have happened and I would say you can track most of the IPs of course there are smart people but they are not like I wouldn't say the smartest people they are not the biggest criminals actually the people on the internet are still calling it an, an anonymous currency where? well on uh, few weeks ago I, I looked into it and uh, especially people who try to bash uh, the Bitcoin system yeah. Yeah. they're labeling it as an anonymous currency yeah yeah there is a lot of people bashing the Bitcoin uh -huh. system it's, uh, it's incredible how people bash I, I said it before I mean the bad taste and also because it's a disruptive innovation yeah really. that, that, that's the thing so of course it's like a uh, voice over IP for telco and I, I, I read that the, uh, the FBI has acknowledged that they have tried to destroy it from the inside. Okay. Is that true? I don't know. I know that the, the, the core development uh, group that is taking position to be the only or the central group of maintenance for Bitcoin, mostly based in the US, um, that took over after Satoshi Nakamoto, this mythical figure, uh, left, they are collaborating with the government of US. Okay. They have been uh, convocated by the CIA already in June, and and actually they have in in a in a CIA organized or sponsored uh, convention in uh, in uh, California, I think, with a good weather. They talked about it. It's a serious issue, of course. Uh, what we have to do, actually, to go on, I would argue, is to be open to dialogue because what is happening is really big and a lot of us predicted it for different reasons I'm a political activist myself I predicted it for a lot of inju social injustice that is going on in the world but wh when this is happening we have to facilitate not the control of it by all powers but the mutual understanding of what is really happening that's what I call it manage. so they are collaborating of course with their own uh, government on it and I argue it's kind of a smart idea because the thing got so big that you can hardly control it I would argue also that it's not exactly in the interest of the established powers to actually make an innovation uh, blossom so I hope and I guess in Europe we have a better opportunity to do this mm -hmm. the history of cryptography tells us so um, coming back to pseudonymous I think we understood what it is about now the blockchain the blockchain is actually this thing that when you start Bitcoin starts downloading and it's now quite big I think it's over 600 megabytes and uh, the blockchain is actually what I mentioned is the history of all transactions so 
what's that for anonymous? You know? <laughs> we really need to think to talk to journalists nowadays, you know. And, mm -hmm. um, and financial economists, we can leave them rot into their soup, but you know, like <laughs> journalists. And uh, basically, uh, when you download a, a blockchain, you have the whole history made of sequential identifiers, which are just the, 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 the identifiers that are hashed, and timestamped uh, and a timestamped list of transactions. So, basically, every transaction is what, uh, in some other formulations, was called. Um, uh, I forgot the term. It's a Japanese researcher. Anyway, every transaction is a triple uh, signing uh, receipt, which basically marks what was the value before and what is the value after. So it's basically uh, just a delta between the two values with a timestamp. So this transaction actually is linked to the others and should match the same values. And all the blockchain, you can, uh, as far as you can go back in the blockchain and join it to confirm signed by many people uh, transactions, then you can say, okay, this transaction has actually happened. So it looks like this. And you can see that if you have like gray uh, branches, then you actually, uh, you are not, like here there would be a double payment, but uh, the thing uh, goes on on that side. And I understood that there's a, a small time window in, in which you could try to double spend. There is. There is a time window for double spending until uh, the client of Bitcoin marks a transaction as confirmed mm -hmm. once it's signed by at least six nodes. That's the convention right now. So will it, will it be uh, withdrawn if it uh, detects double spending? Uh, yes. Basically it's not valid anymore. People don't recognize it. That's the way they are handled collisions, let's say. It's like a blockchain. And as much signing you have, once it's out there, you gave it, people start signing it. And so the, the window for double spending, uh, it is mm -hmm. interesting for a lot of people, like to actually study the vulnerabilities of this system. But uh, it, I wouldn't say it's so, it's more like a denial of service attacks on transactions. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, the final effect of it. And. Uh, well, there are other DOS uh, approaches, but uh, for instance, the, the, also the civil uh, approach wouldn't work, like the attack, the cryptographic attack, or, uh, uh, well, yeah, that's more or less how, how it works. So, uh, the Genesis block is what defines, is the box that is not entering the slides here, is what is the originating block is what actually defines the um, the whole chain so it starts from a genesis block by convention this genesis block is a string and by convention this string usually holds the title of a newspaper with a date because that is a way to bind it to reality so that thing really happened on that date and the original mainnet bitcoin uh, Genesis is the one up there that Satoshi Nakamoto, this mysterious man who arguably is not Japanese um, because I mean many people have done the research he doesn't have an history really in, in Japan and it's yeah, has disappeared put inside so the Times 3 January 2009 cancel or on brink of second bailouts for banks so his resentment is clear if you read the code uh, other things, if you read the code, are not so clear, unfortunately. Um, the weeds uh, fork of the Genesis uh, says other things. The weeds was made by Carlson, another developer that has started his effort on multi-coin. And you have a lot of forks of this Genesis block. The most uh, recently famous is the Cosby coin. Uh, uh, which is a great investment, I think, in the history of computing and popular uh, culture, uh, was uh, used for uh, on the defacement made also by some people from the forum of one of the websites of Bitcoin. So as you can see, I mean, there were also like the carrots uh, done like as, as new coins and many other kind of coins. 
as you can see, it's, a light, it's in a live community, it doesn't lack irony, it doesn't lack humor, and also self-criticism. And um, so, there are some interesting things in this slide that uh, I should highlight. First of all, one thing is, okay, when are the, the point of uh, vulnerability? When are the moments of vulnerability of the system? By the experiments that uh, uh, Carlson made on, uh, on uh, Multicoin, it is clear now, and weeds, it's clear now that the network, when you start it, is extremely vulnerable. So Bitcoin is where it is only thanks to the fact it has hyped. Sorry. If, it wouldn't, if it wouldn't have hyped <coughs> like it did, it would be very vulnerable. If it would be a few people using it, it would be very easy to counterfeit. Uh, actually bitcoins into that network. So what you have to make sure when you really want to put the network in production is that there has been a considerable amount of computation and transactions already flowing into the system, which is about a social dynamic, I would argue. So that's a, a further link into, into societal dynamics. Another thing that is interesting to mention is our internal discussion and why I actually declared Freecoin as a fork of Bitcoin basically back in June. As you can see the, the web page with the very eloquent picture of Schumpeter who is watching you. Um, the Freecoin fork was done on this, um, on this line of thought that the Genesis block should be configurable as soon as possible should be made configurable as a feature into the Bitcoin client. This generates a lot of controversy in the world community. So uh, I'll try to explain my reasons why I'm an advocate of this passage. I do think that uh, Bitcoin is a very interesting technology and as such I think it's worth to develop further. I'm not the only one thinking that. But one of the problems in developing further this technology is the fact that most of the core developers that make decisions and guard right now the code are stakeholders. And if you have a system in which the developers are stakeholders, then the developers will be very conservative about making changes into a system in which they invested already. So there you go with your neutrality to the topic. How can you be really objective about something as a scientist should be when you actually have a huge investment into it. A uh, very hard topic for our times actually in which you know most universities are becoming enterprises. So leaving aside that argument I would say that um, the problem here is basically that if Bitcoin keeps on being maintained by people that are stakeholders into it it might become just like and close it. It didn't. They didn't obfuscate the code. There wasn't such a thing. But there were controversies in saying, okay, is this the priority to actually put out the configuration file for it? Carlson was with the, with Weeds was the first one to do it. He just took out the strings into the C code, put them into a configuration file. That configuration file marks which uh, net you're using. If you're using the so-called main net, which is the main net of Bitcoin, or other networks with the same mechanism, same code, and just uh, uh, put the data payload into another position so that it can be loaded. Uh, I'm one of the advocates of this approach. Why? Because I think, as we said before, that uh, the cap is not such a bad thing as, uh, uh, as economists uh, argue, uh, as Krugman also argued, recently is not such a bad thing if we do have multiple currencies, if we do have, if we do open this constituency to more communities, not just the geek uh, community online, but more communities that can actually have, if they are big enough and they organize well enough, they can have a uh, method of transaction for values. And this is coming back more to a philosophical question, like whether more currencies are useful or not. So the literature about this, I think the most interesting is uh, pointing out to Bernard Litter that around uh, complementary currency systems, I think we shouldn't see this 
uh, as a movement to actually complete split from the existing networks although we can just start negotiating values with existing networks and this has a lot of possibilities actually. so what I'm referring to is all the economical formulations behind the, the so-called credit circuits for instance, the commercial uh, credit circuit C3 uh, is one of the most uh, um, the, the, the historical formulations for a, a credit circuit uh, there is actually the, the, the inventors, the, the main uh, institution working on it is Dutch, it's in Utrecht, it's called Social Trade Organization, STRO and they actually worked in the past 20 years also with UNESCO to actually implement these systems in places that are, um, that are really uh, thriving with poverty and scarcity uh, the recent, uh, in the recent uh, example was in Uruguay so these credit circuits create an internal currency that can actually raise the speed of circulation of business inside a certain community so if you have an institution that will pay you as a provider of goods uh, in a later time you can already transform that promise, trustable <coughs> promise of a government into some money that you circulate within your circuit that's a very simple explanation and then of course you do uh, have an insurance on this circuit and you do have an offer uh, to go out of this circuit and change it back into euros and you do have incentives to stay in this creates a situation in which if there is scarcity of the main governmental money you still have people getting busy without telling them to dig holes and fill them back so um, back to the uh, technology of Bitcoin uh, let's have a look at how it actually you have about uh, five minutes left Whoa. Yeah, but these are the most, the, the fast, the quickest, I think you will understand these things very quick. The most uh, interesting uh, thing is how it communicates. Okay, this graph is yeah. visible. So it has a JSON RPC um, interaction with the graphical user interface. And then it reaches the other clients through the IRC on using Freenode. Initially one channel and then random channels. This is uh, bonkers. Uh, obviously, yeah. <laughs> so it just shows you uh, shows you how immature is this whole technology. It's absolutely bonkers. There is a lot of uh, uh, developments to, to do. The dependencies are uh, these, basically static. Are oh sorry, there's some Italian is slipped in there. Uh, static are uh, crypto PP by Way Guy, which is like a, a, a C plus plus implementation of uh, SHA algorithms, uh, actually only the SHA-256 is used for that JSON Spirit, which Spirit is like a, a language interpreter, a grammar parser for JSON, <laughs> which are quite handy but work of course it's all based on C++, C++ so it's boost uh, system, uh, file system, program options, which would be getopt and the thread from boost, then it uses OpenSSL, the 0.9.8 it's fine uh, Lib Crypto, uh, the Berkeley DB, which is right now 4.7 in the official distributed binaries, will become 4.8. I will tell you why this is important. The G thread for uh, uh, wrapping the, the POSIX threads, the mini UPMP, which is an optional library to actually communicate to UPMP routers to open the ports because the transactions are done on different ports, those are not done on the on the IRC, Jericho. and then the WXGUI. You just got uh, 15 minutes extra. Wow, <laughs> bonus <Bump stage. laughs> Just because I show you some technical stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're drooling over it. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is a bit of the overview. The API, the uh, RPC API for uh, working over JSON is this one, and uh, in, the, in the dots are the most important calls so uh, yeah the get account is uh, um, you get an account address get address by account accounts and addresses is like this pseudonymic exchange of uh, uh, creating pseudonymous get balance is your balance 
uh, get a new address is uh, creating a new uh, pseudonym, uh, pseudonym uh, address to, to, to use. Uh, you can uh, query what are received by accounts and by addresses. You can get the transactions uh, from uh, uh, how much and from whom to whom. So these are querying basically the blockchain. The Bitcoin is a demon, it sits between you and blockchain and you can query what is happening on the blockchain. Most people have actually used it this way, then there are more and actually even some unused. And the API, I would say, it doesn't shine for, um, for being so beautiful, but it actually works. And a lot of the uh, current implementation in C++ is just like, let's use it, it works, but then it doesn't look really good. So a rewrite is very, uh, is very much the case. These are the problems. The C++ code is not documented. Um, if you read it uh, more than once, you start realizing that some things were planned and were nicely placed together, but then there is a certain point in which uh, the coder started writing more uh, quickly and actually rushed into a solution and to make it work dirty but works and so basically there is this like kind of views I would say by my estimation like the first year and a half was very calm and well thought architecture and then making it work was the first uh, the first thing then the WX GUI is completely uh, to be obsoleted in Freecoin I just cut it out because it uses Bitcoin in the old way from binary codes so actually the first Bitcoin that came into like fame, it was made out of two binaries. One was the daemon and the second one was the daemon compiled together with the GUI, still with daemon functionalities. There was no process separation. Uh, the JSON was in there but was not used. So people are starting to use new GUIs. If you write a graphical user interface for Bitcoin, do it using, using the JSON API. That's, that's exactly why I left Bitcoin. I, I found it a year and a half ago, and I thought, well, in, in the state it is in now, you can't really do much with it. So I left it to see what would happen in the future. I forked it when I saw how slowly the actual maintainers accept your right. patches inside. So, anyway, the Berkeley DB is very non portable. What it does, I mentioned it before is if you have a database that is uh, made with BerkeleyDB 4.6 for instance say you use the Bitcoin linked after a, a shared link with the uh, LibDB 4.6 then you <coughs> take your wallet, you bring it on another computer that has LibDB 4.8 what we'll do is upgrade the whole database to 4.8 when you take your wallet and you bring it back to the old 4.6 it won't work anymore, it's not backward compatible that's a very good reason to not use the Berkeley ADB in my opinion. So SQLite should be used instead, absolutely. So uh, another thing is the wallet is preserved in clear, that's why like people were stolen. Uh, if you install the Bitcoin client from Debian, what Debian does, it creates your user and password to the daemon um, in, and saves it in clear, generates it random and saves it in clear inside a dot .bitcoin directory. So it's completely uh, also that is completely insecure. In general, Bitcoin, what it does, it's not anymore a bank holding your, your digital account, it delivers the user all the security measures to actually guard your own possessions. So if you do it like this, it's just like quite suicidal. Uh, what needs definitely is uh, embedded implicit security, intuitive security. The user must be already uh, already as, as it starts to a, to a decent level of security and the majority of algorithms inside the binary code inside the, 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 the main C++ client we are talking about are all binary arithmetics a lot of them are and they use bit shifting a lot so it's little Indian on for now so forget MIPS platforms um, the development is going into these directions uh, out of my impression or should go it's kind of wishful thinking one of the biggest thing that is being talked about is the implementation of Merkle trees for actually avoiding that everyone needs to hold 600 megabytes of blockchain so when the history of all transactions 
grow, people uh, don't need to actually have a big storage on their computer, which might become in future a mobile phone. Uh, this is a very uh, big disadvantage in Bitcoin, also considering the I.O., the input-output rate. When uh, you run Bitcoin, you will notice that your hard disk is really, really going uh, hard. So if you are running Bitcoin on a machine with a SSD or basically a solid state storage, it will be worn out very fast. So these are problems that need to be solved and uh, they are still pending. Uh, the, the intuitive storage security I mentioned, uh, the code should be cleaned up and, uh, and documented. But at this stage, as we are now, I would say it needs to be rewritten. And this is what I'm pointing you out also with Freecoin. Here you will find a link to this uh, RSS feed, which is a Gitorius, um, a Gitorius <coughs> account, where Genjix, my friend who also pointed the uh, bus uh, to, to, to me to, for this presentation, actually is rewriting uh, completely from scratch using uh, C++ uh, and he's calling it libbitcoin, so he's making it a library. There was a lot of talks since the earlier stage of Bitcoin of actually making it just a library. Uh, the other things that are being developed and actually make the most interest into people are service applications. Intersango is an example, is an open source implementation, again done by Genjix and the folks at the Bitcoin consultancy, which is basically a transaction. Uh, system, so you can uh, they use it for the Bitcoin transaction. For instance, is the software that runs for the uh, change of British pounds to Bitcoin. Uh, the community application uh, is what I am mostly interested. I am quoting here Bitcoin and Dindi and Kultos, which are the, some experiments we want to start here in the Netherlands very soon. So Bitcoin is one of the most interesting working implementations that I can see using Bitcoin to actually create a content syndication network where you can rate up things, vote them, submit stories using Bitcoin. So you pay a little bit and your story is up there. Everyone that will vote you up will give you a little percentage of money and in this way actually you get content up there and you get the most appreciated content producers uh, a bit of a reward in Bitcoins. This, I think, is the most interesting implementation that came out so far. So I hope it stays up because it was down for one month. You can imagine it as a slash dot with money, for instance. I mean, uh, it's a kind of very interesting application for it because it creates this low latency exchange and stuff like that. Uh, the Dindi and Kultos uh, project, which is basically documented on this website, that was also around uh, it was launched in the Bali here in Amsterdam already in November to the cultural sector is an effort, is an academic effort in actually building a pattern language for alternative and complementary money, system, money systems. So how do you actually develop a money system into a community? What are the patterns that you need to be careful with? It's not really from a technical point of view but mostly from an architectural point of view. And uh, the cultos is this formulation for a cultural credit circuit. You know about the financial cuts, the, the cultural cuts, in the, in the cultural funding cuts, the design here in the Netherlands. So uh, we all are from the cultural sector in a very difficult position right now. What, uh, what it can become this difficult position, a stimulus for actually producing more and producing better and actually creating a network that support each other. So that's the cultos should be a cultural credit circuit for, for cultural workers and we are open to participation. So to, to conclude, I think these are the advantages brought in by Bitcoin. And last but not least, tax innovation. I didn't talk about it much, but I hope you actually realize that the triple signed transactions are a very uh, mature by now tax uh, system innovation. It is documented, I will put it in the references, the last research was done, especially in Japan, the last publications are from the 90s and the 80s and still it wasn't accepted because it's too disruptive. Um, it's too disruptive for the status quo but it's not that disruptive for the people. Actually, uh, the double uh, accounting, the double book accounting is officially traced back in 1496 
It was invented by a monk, a friar in, in Venice, and we are still using that system. So it's kind of the time to say, okay, it's obsolete, and let's look at these things and not, not get afraid of them. Uh, collateral effects, what is worrying, of course, is the end of another uh, state monopoly. Uh, it's, uh, it can bring to the uh, even increased deregulation. Arguably, in economy, the deregulation that started from 84 has produced a lot of, a lot of uh, damages to society, or the subprime market and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it has a potential of alienation of local economies. Uh, it, uh, uh, it creates a, a user-centered security system in which, of course, there will be still an optional market. I mean, banks could be the ones that optionally take care of your security, but you don't have to use a bank if you're, if you're a cryptographer, for instance. And it's very immature software, I guess it was clear from this presentation. These are the cool things, in my opinion, uh, to look at that are happening right now. Uh, Witcoin I named Namecoin, which is developing as a money system for domain name resolution. Um, the trades, uh, they are very interesting. Uh, if you like wool, I do love wool. I'm lucky that my partner, she is a knitter, yet you can buy a lot of alpaca, alpaca wool socks on, on the internet with bitcoins, which was actually the first meme coming out of bitcoins. That's why the alpaca is the symbol of it. So actually there is one good thing that uh, it's interesting in bitcoin is that the people is really attentive to artisanal economies, to local production. Yet I mentioned there is a potential for the a disruptive potential for local economies but the spirit of the people is that of micropayments, microfinancing, locally. Uh, that's what we aim with Freecoin. There is a mailing list. It was silent until now. This is the third presentation in which Freecoin is mentioned. It will be active very soon. Let's stay in touch through that if you're interested. We're going to open a money lab here in Amsterdam very soon to work on these things. And this is the plan for the integration of C3 and peer-to-peer -peer currencies, which I mentioned before. Some of the books that I quoted in this and uh, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> so, I, uh, do I have time for questions? Or, uh, uh, a few minutes. Yeah. I have a question about the future. Uh, if I understood correctly, um, Bitcoin is based on a uh, shard um, 256 uh, hash algorithm. Uh, it's actually considered a uh, secure hash algorithm. But uh, what about the future? When the, this algorithm will be considered uh, unsecure? Um, what, uh, what will happen to the um, existing transaction? they potentially, potentially lost their uh, uniqueness. Yes. So um, we can uh, potentially inject uh, a fake uh, transaction, va um, valid transaction in the history, in the Bitcoin chain. Well, you could uh, uh, actually, well, yeah, you have like a collision. So you can actually uh, create collisions. So, so double spending. Well, I don't think it's really going to be a problem for but the past. Yeah, for the, the past, past is yeah, not that much of a problem. In the sense that everyone has a copy of the past. So even if you corrupt your own copy or someone else's copy, you can see compared to everyone else and see that the majority has the, 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 the uh, good copy, for example. So you say 90% of people have this copy, the 10% is wrong. So the problem of uh, creating, you know, messing with the past is probably not going to happen. The problem is, is that it, you know the, uh, at the moment where the algorithm is not uh, you know uh, strong enough anymore, people will stop using Bitcoin because it's not secure sure. anymore and move to something else. Probably it would be better if the also the algorithm it's used actually uh, gets more uh, complicated with time. In the same way as the you know the, 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 the uh, mining for Bitcoins gets more difficult with time, the same a similar thing would be done with the algorithm used. For example, there is an algorithm for uh, password hashing, which is uh, uh, which uh, uses a loop that uh, can be tuned and can be uh, made uh, more expensive over time, so that you know, ten years from now, you use the same algorithm but with a di different parameter, so that it takes more time and it still you know takes, for example, one second to hash the password just to say. So it would be nice 
to use a, a similar approach for Bitcoin so that you have a parameter and that parameter gets tuned over time so that you know in 2020 uh, it, it's still yeah. uh, no, it is still impossible to, to crack it. But, you know. Yeah, at a certain point from there on the transactions will happen with that uh, hash right. number. So if I actually uh, say to the Bitcoin network I have this transaction and it is a valid transaction uh, the network mm, should uh, recognize this is a fake but it's very fake that is strange stuff uh, well the way it works now uh, if, if, I, uh, if I, uh, I understand correctly is that you have many nodes verifying your transaction yes. so uh, you broadcast the transaction so basically uh, to make a double payment, you still have to uh, uh, to convince a lot of nodes of what you're saying. So I'm not sure if just a collision allows you to make a double payment. Because if you broadcast a transaction, it means that you are broadcasting the fact that you have something that corresponds to a creation of a chain. So yeah, there was a minor creation. If I remember correctly the way it works, uh, if you find a collision, what happens is that you may be able to uh, generate a fake Bitcoin. So you have an yeah. extra coin on yeah. your account, but you can kind of still fake transactions. So you're not faking a transaction, you're, still, you're, you're just uh, uh, counterfeiting money. So the problem with, with collision is that at that point, you cannot, uh, you know, it's like having fake money in your hands. So yeah. you cannot trust the, the, the coin being actually uh, legit. But I, I guess, you know, when people start actually doing that, uh, what happens is that you, you just move to a different algorithm. That, that, you know, yeah. like, again, the way it is now, you have to actually change the program. It would be nicer if it could be something that happens automatically over time. It's still pretty experimental. I think the same way. Of course, this has uh, a lot has to be researched, but that is what would happen, and it is definitely possible to change. But we, we can say that uh, given that, that there's a lot of people using it, given that there are no reports of you know uh, big problems right now, it is quite okay at this point because you know, you know you don't hear of people being uh, uh, you know uh, having to do with counterfeit uh, bitcoins or having, having been uh, actually uh, it's not a problem but I'm thinking about that well like, you know from, from what he said as well the future will probably mean uh, another client because this, this client is you know not, not even good from yeah, the definitely. Or so. I forgot to mention the clients that are most interesting there is uh, one client that is being developed by one of uh, the employees of Google is Bitcoin J or J Bitcoin is the Java client as much as I don't like Java still it's supposed to be a rewrite which is interesting there is this Lib Bitcoin that uh, is developed uh, and um, there are uh, already Python bindings for it as much as we did Python bindings for the old Bitcoin that's free coin we remove all the GUI and we just put Python bindings and then there is uh, GUI but only GUI that communicates with JSON, which is uh, built by TCRTM, the customer, it's like Bitcoin JS, I think it's called, and it's in JavaScript, and it's designed for uh, mobile, uh, touch screen. So there are already new clients, both on the GUI level and on the, on the core level. There will be, and at this point also there will be, there might be, what I argue there should be, more networks. So if it's something that is, uh, it has, we, we come back to the philosophical question, why do you buy into a system? Why do you actually want to use certain system? And uh, uh, I know a lot of uh, people that are considered poor and dysfunctional in our society, I mean, from a Calvinistic point of view, yet you could argue that they are just people that decided to not make money because they don't like this money, because they don't like the media, because the media is the message and they don't like the message that this media carries so they prefer to be poor and happy than rich and unhappy this is like a stereotype as well of course is not so um, I mean easy to, to accept you know when we just have a game and everyone should play it so at the end when, when a new client uh, comes out it's also about a new client okay a new constituency a new uh, maybe a new seed maybe a, a, a new genesis code so, uh, other questions before I close? Okay, cool, we're fine. Done.
Thank you again, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you to the CWI for this and uh, to you, Kai and Bas, for organizing the free software day. And uh, yes, thank you very much for this highly interesting uh, talk. <laughs> I suspect you don't drink alcohol. Yes, a little bit, but not at this time of the day. Okay. <laughs> can, can I present you uh, a bottle of wine? Oh, thank you. Yeah.